Okay, hello. Um, welcome back. Uh, this week we are discussing documentary expression and popular photography. <clears throat> So as, as usual, I'm going to set the stage for the time frame that we're in, and then we're going to talk through um, some things about documentary photography. We're going to talk about the Farm Security Administration, and we're going to navigate into World War II and the propaganda photography that was being used around that time. So a lot of photographers during the 1930s were very much influenced by what you would describe as a modernist aesthetic, but they're subject matter was different than the documentary photography that had come before that. They were very much responding to social and political realities of the Depression. Those of you who don't know, the 1930s was a time in the United States where there was a very, um, a Great Depression, and it, I mean, it's called the Great Depression, um, and there was a lot of um, poverty uh, happening around that time, extreme poverty. And so the emergence of documentary photography as a means of kind of addressing those realities um, really had this great legacy that allowed us to build this uh, visual archive of what was happening around this time. Other things that are happening in the 1930s, the radio becomes a main uh, fixture in people's homes. Um, I'm forgetting to flip through um, the slides here as I'm talking, but the radio previously wasn't something that everyone could afford, but now it has been um, uh, sort of finessed into a consumer product that uh, almost anyone can buy and have in their home. And here's an image of a family sitting, staring at this big giant box. That box with the vase on top of it is a is an old radio. So. Why is that important? Well, people's trust in the sort of truth and impartiality of radio broadcasts um, kind of took over how much they trusted newspapers and um, written publications. You have to imagine kind of the difference between a real person speaking the news to you when before it was only shown to you through images and text. So you have this voice coming out of the box and, and you trust that voice more so than you trust something that's um, printed text or printed images. You also didn't necessarily have to wait for the newspaper to come out to learn about what was happening anymore because the radio was able to give you like up to the minute news updates in their broadcasts and it was right in your home. Other things happening around this time. So we know that um, moving pictures have happened. We know that silent movies had been prevalent for a few years at this point, and they were now starting to integrate sound into the movies, and not just a soundtrack that would be played on a record or um, a live orchestra alongside the moving pictures, but real recorded voices speaking and singing in sync with the movies. Um, movies at this time were still um, incredibly novel, and so today when we go to the movies, there's, they're always preceded by some, you know, some commercials about the, the theater and, and the membership that you can get, and then, you know, some funny little cartoons about turning your, your phone on silent, and then, of course, we have the previews. Um, all of this sort of pre-movie media started way back in the early days of, of film, um, both entertainment and documentary films were often preceded by the newsreel. And so instead of having previews, you would have um, moving pictures of the news and someone talking about the news to you. And this was the only way to see moving pictures of news before television was if you went to see a film in the theater. So now we have, in the 1930s, we have magazines and newspapers that are running both text and images, countless publications that are um, prolific, they're everywhere. We also have radio and we have movies. So it's during this time that regular average people start to have a, a multimedia experience in a way that they never did before and in a way that we can kind of understand it today. So We've looked at documentary photographers in a sense already throughout 
many of our discussions, but it wasn't really until the 1930s that the term documentary um, was being used widely to describe the things that, that we've been looking at as documentary. If you remember when we were looking at the work of Jacob Reese and John Thompson, um, they had images that showed, you know, sort of the misfortune that falls upon on um, people who are in the lower classes. Um, they're representing people in categories, right? Um, whether it's showing what their job or occupation is, what their class is, their status in society, or um, their ethnicity. And this, this um, previous documentary photography differs greatly from the way that photographers in the 1930s approached their documentary photographs. Um, these photographers were looking to present their subjects um, in a more relatable way so that um, viewers could find it more accessible. They were trying to not other these people in a way that, you know, Jacob Rees and John Thompson and others had done before, right? When you other someone, it's, it's other than you, right? It's separate from you and you can't necessarily access um, what that person might be going through when they're represented in these types of images. The 1930s documentary photography photographers really wanted people to be able to identify with them in a way um, that's that's very different from anything that came before. So the goal essentially was to make the messages conveyed through the images kind of cover a wide spectrum of audiences, but provoke them to make the images and the messages personal, which can always be a really difficult thing to do. So the, the difference sort of is that the earlier social documentary photographs that we've looked at tended to be, um, uh, the, the voice that they had was more condescending, right? And you're, they're putting folks into categories that define them, whereas these new documentary photographs were trying not to do that as much. Um, documentary photography was heavily influenced by filmmaking and film theory. Um, a lot of the early filmmakers were using documentary techniques in order to create their films. Um, the example that your textbook gives you is Giga Vertov. He would leave his studio with his video camera and he would just kind of wander around the streets sort of aimlessly and just film everything as he saw it. And then that footage that he developed during that time was edited into um, one of his very popular films called The Man, um, Man with the Movie Camera. Now, if a film is interesting to you, um, I highly recommend watching it. Um, it's not required for this class, but it's, it's an interesting um, piece of history to take in. Um, the movie, or the film Grass, is an example of an early documentary film made in 1923. And this film, follows this migration process of the Bakhtiari people of Iran over this journey that they take with all of their livestock, families, everything they own from one point to another. I'm going to show you a portion of this film so that you can kind of get an idea of what uh, types of documentary films were being shown in the 1920s. So let me get... Oh, I have to get the share screen up. Okay. Let me get our film here. So, there it goes. All right, we will watch grass.
So that's our clip from from Grass. Um, you can see that um, I should say if you're um, if you couldn't hear that because the the volume was too low. The link is, of course, in the Blackboard course materials um, for you to watch that separately. Um, but you can see that uh, this is like kind of a a lot of these documentary filmmakers like to tell what you might call exotic stories, um, but things that you couldn't see because they were far away from you and you couldn't travel to go to go see these these things that other people did. But they would tell it in a very factual manner, and it's very similar to how we see documentaries today, um, but just of the 1920s. For example, you'll notice even though there's um, music overlaid on this film that we just watched, um, they're still using the screens that kind of give you some text. And that's really important because that's something that film kind of took from um, storytelling and photography because we've, we've talked a lot about the combination of um, text and the image. For example, we, when we were looking at Lewis Hines' images that he was taking at Ellis Island, a lot of um, the portraits were accompanied by information that he would get uh, from his you know, very short time with each of his subjects to give you a little more context of what you're looking at and why it might be important. And <clears throat> the same thing happened in these early films, um, before you had sound incorporated the voices to talk in the movies, they would have the the screen kind of broken up every so often with some text to tell to help tell the story and to give you context for what you're kind of experiencing here. So that obviously starts to fade once you get. Um, technology evolves into talking movies, but before that, that was very prevalent. And it harkens back to um, its influence from photography. The next thing I want to talk about is the Farm Security Administration, or the FSA. Um, so the FSA had um, a lot of photographers working with other under their employ. And I think you'll be able to see how they were both influenced by documentary filmmaking and the documentary photographers who came before, as well as how they kind of created their own documentary styles over this time. So essentially at its core, the FSA is or was an effort during the Depression to combat American rural poverty. And they stressed rural rehabilitation efforts to improve um, the lifestyle of people who were impoverished during this time. And I'm not saying they were just kind of poor, like they were destitute. Um, examples of, of, of folks who, who were in this, this group, sharecroppers, um, tenants, very poor landowning farmers, um, and the FSA wanted to set up this program where they could purchase a whole bunch of land that's owned by poor farmers, and then resettle those farmers together in groups on land that's more suitable for farming. <clears throat> a lot of the poor farmers were poor because they had over-farmed their land, and then it wouldn't yield the, the crops um, that they needed to be financially stable. So the government was, was trying to put together this program to, to help them. So, we're going to talk a little bit more about documentary photography at this time, how it was used by the, the FSA photographers. So the documentary photography genre describes photographs that would work as sort of a, a time capsule for evidence in the future or um, something that you could use as a frame of reference for this specific time in history. Um, it, these, these photographs are showing facts but they're also showing emotion and asking for emotion from the viewer. It's also really important to understand the significance of the agency of the photographer here. Each of these photographers who's creating images for the FSA are very specifically using framing and camera angles, which are always valuable tools that give meaning to the image and influence how it's going to be perceived by the audience. The FSA photographers used this method of documentary photography that not only gives information, but 
again, like I can't emphasize enough how significant this aspect of, of emotion was to them. They wanted to move people. So they were creating these very um, emotionally persuasive and stylized depictions of some very symbolic images. Uh, the image you see on your screen now, there's a sign that says, Four children for sale in choir within. This might seem kind of humorous at first glance, but it, during the 1930s, this was something that was a very um, real thing that was happening. Like, families could not afford to feed all of their children or even themselves. They could barely afford to keep their property if they had any. And so they would sell their children essentially into, you know, likely child labor somewhere and in order to be able to just hang on and get by while everything was so, so bad. Um, this is Roy Stryker. Um, he was kind of the, the head honcho with the FSA. Um, and his goal with all of this was to introduce America to the Americans. And um, what, what that means is that, you know, the classes were so divided and access to images, especially in rural areas, was still something that wasn't easy to do. You didn't have a, always a lot of access to the, the newspapers and magazines unless you were in a more urban area. So his goal was to create this archive so that it could be shared with the entire country and everyone could see what was happening. Um, many of the most famous Depression era photographers were um, part of the FSA project. Um, there, there's three in particular we're going to talk about. Um, Walker Evans on the left here, uh, Dorothea Lang on the right, and then of course uh, Gordon Parks. They're some of the most famous uh, photographers from that group. And their images are actually now considered a national treasure in the United States, which is why this project is so multifaceted. It's not just um, you know, a work to encourage social reform and provoke government uh, reformation in these impoverished areas, but it's also a great work of art from the standpoint of that these three were artists, and so their photographs are, are emotionally compelling and moving and beautifully um, taken. Um, all of the photographers were under very strict instruction from Washington as to what overall impression the images should portray. So again, they are all being paid. They are commissioned by the government, which is money. Um, but in this situation, it's a little bit different than how we've we've looked at it before. We've kind of talked about missions in a in a negative way, where the government is is deciding, you know, what content there's going to be, and it's usually to make things look better than they are. This situation was the complete opposite. They wanted the raw reality of what was happening so that they could support um, their argument for the government to come in and, and make the changes that were necessary. So this is sort of, uh, I'll probably say this again down the road, but this ends up being a good type of propaganda in a way. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that again later. Um, so Roy Stryker had this agenda, and he he had a very strong faith in in social engineering. Um, there were, you know, he he was very concerned with the poor conditions among the cotton farmers and the migrant farm workers. But he was very very committed to social reform through this um, intervention in people's lives, and we call it an intervention because you know these people didn't ask to be photographed. Um, and oftentimes they weren't even told why they were being photographed, but the photographers that did go in and, and document this um, were, were, were trying to help in a way. Um, Stryker wanted photographs that related people to the land and, and vice versa because these photographs would reinforce that position that poverty could be controlled by changing the land practices, which is what they were trying to get the government to do. Um, so 
Stryker never um, specifically told his photographers how they should compose the shots, but he did always send them lists of themes that he had expected them to incorporate into their images. Sometimes he would just send a list that says um, church, court day, barns, something like that. And and then any of the photographers in his, his group there would be expected to um, fulfill his request for those types of images. He was really interested in photographs of migratory workers that could kind of tell a story of their life, um, how their like just their daily life, how they lived from morning until night. And this is important because again, no one saw this happening. So you had to go out and photograph it in order for the entire country to see that it was a true reality. He asked, um, uh, on the topic of his lists, again, he specifically asked Dorothea Lange to emphasize uh, themes like cooking and sleeping and praying and socializing. And, you know, he, he would send other prompts to other photographers as well. The FSA made over 250,000 images of rural poverty during this time, which is an insane amount of photographs, especially for the 1930s. Um, not all of the photographs kind of made it. Uh, it's fewer than half of them actually are still around, and they are all housed in the Prints and Photographs Division of the Library of Congress, and they have digitized all of them online so you can view them if you care to. I will have that link in the Blackboard for you in the course materials folder, but I will show it to you now so that you can see, just get a little preview of what's what's happening. So here, Library of Congress, um, Farm Security Administration Office of War Information, Black and White Negatives. So if you were to click through, like there's 1,754 pages of these photographs and you can kind of jump around and, and see the different types of images that were made. And you'll, you'll notice that you can see some that look very, very different some that are, you can see them taking multiples of different things, but they literally digitized every single negative from this project, which is kind of amazing. And also amazing that it's free to access on their website too, because sometimes the images don't get digitized in a way that allows us to see them because it's a huge process. Um, if you had to scan, a high resolution scan of 164,000 negatives, like I can't even imagine how long that would take. But um, now that we have a little background on the FSA and how Roy Stryker was kind of organizing things, um, let's look specifically at those three photographers that I mentioned earlier, um, and we'll start with Walker Evans. So aside from being like a very prominent fixture with the FSA, he's also one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. His photographs and also he has a lot of publications that he did too have inspired so many generations of artists that have come after him. Um, for example, um, Helen Levitt and um, also Robert Frank, who we will talk more about, I think, next week, if I'm remembering the timeline correctly, um, or next class, I should say. Um, Deanne Arbus, who might look very different from the photographs that we see Walker Evans make, but she was very much inspired by, um, you know, the emotion that he could pull from an image. Um, Lee Friedlander as well, and um, Brendan Hilla Becker, who uh, did more of this architectural typology as opposed to um, portraiture, but it's still very much influenced by the way that Evans was making his photographs throughout the 20th century. So um, because he's one of the first to use the documentary tradition in American photography, he had this like really incredible ability to kind of see the present as if it was already the past. And he translates that knowledge and his vision into an art form. And that's really hard to do. It's always really difficult to separate yourself from your present, right? Um, you have he he really looked at his present and documented as if it, it was the past. And of course, it becomes the past once it's captured in a photograph. But um, he he really has 
a hold on this visual language. Um, he finds people along the road um, in, you know, cafes. Um, he, he takes photographs at different roadside establishments. He documented advertisements. He would go into people's homes and document their intimate spaces of their bedrooms. Um, he also did, you know, views of, of small town streets. So um, he really like, ran the gamut with his subject matter. He wasn't just focused on portraiture or architecture or anything like that, but he was focused on telling this story of what was happening at this time. So for 50 years from the late 1920s to the early 1970s, Evans recorded the American scene. That was, that was what he did. And so essentially what you have with his work is sort of this encyclopedia of a visual catalog of America developing and growing over this 50 year time period. Um, as I've already mentioned, because they're under the direction of Roy Stryker, the FSA photographers were assigned to document this small town life and to demonstrate how the government was attempting to improve the rural communities during the Depression. Um, Evans himself um, didn't care too much about the government interventions that were happening. He was really mostly concerned with the visual history that he was creating. So if he ever got like a itinerary or a list from, from Stryker, he, he usually just kind of blew it off and focused on, you know, his personal desire to distill this essence into his images. He has these um, you know, photographs like this one, which is some, you know, pokey roadside architecture, rural churches. He would take pictures of the barbers, the cemeteries, and there's so much respect in his images, too, you know, for the rural, uh, what they would call the common man. And so through all of this, he really was, you know, one of the, the most preeminent documentarians of, of the 20th century. Um, his images were published in, in magazines and books in the late 1930s and of course, you know, even further beyond that. Um, and, and his images become iconic in a way. They then enter into the public's collective consciousness and they're, they're embedded in this shared history that we have. Um, this image here is a nice one to, to look at because it's, it's really clear that he's telling a story through symbolism. He takes this image in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and his goal is to kind of symbolically guide you from the background to the foreground, and it's a progression of life in three very simple parts. So it's nice because, uh, you know, a lot of his symbolism was not as complex as some of the things we've looked at previously. If you think about some of the photo montages and collages that we looked at last week, they're so chock full of symbolism and meaning that it could take, you know, hours and hours to unpack every little nuance happening there. And Walker Evans, I mean, while his subject matter is significantly different, he's doing it in a way that makes it a little bit more accessible to more people. So the, the sort of progression we're looking at here is if you look at the background, it's all factories. And so that symbolizes work. In the middle ground, you see apartments, homes, home life. And then in the foreground, we have the cemetery, which is his symbol for death here. So you go from work to home to death in whatever cycle it takes you. Um, there's, there's specifically no people in this image, but um, the, the way that he has framed it and you know purposefully flattened the perspective, he, he's using these tools to sort of show how restricted lives are by this sort of work home death that we all go through. Um, it was in 1936 that Evans took a leave of absence from the FSA to travel um, with his friend um, who is a writer. His name is James Agee. Um, 
AG had been um, given an assignment from Fortune magazine to go write this um, article about tenant farmers, and he wanted Evans to make the photographs to accompany this article. Um, of course, as usually happens with these things, the Fortune magazine rejected AG's article because it was, you know, very long. It's about three families in Alabama and so AG and Evans kind of worked together on this collaboration that turned out to be a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men and it was published in 1940. It has, it's 500 pages and it's a combination of James Agee's text and documentary photographs um, taken by Walker Evans. Um, you know, Evans photographs already from what we looked at speak for themselves, but they're very honest. Um, there's no hiding anything about what's happening in these areas. He is sharing portraits of, of people's faces with authentic expressions. He's going again into their intimate spaces and documenting their bedrooms, their kitchens, their clothing. Um, and, you know, as a, as a series, they really make it clear that this is a great tragedy of the depression. Um, but individually, you know, if you look at just one or two of them, they are incredibly intimate images that you want to go into and look at and understand what these folks are going through and, and make a story of your own to go along with that. And they, they still have that emotional appeal Many people consider the works from this Let Us Now Praise Us, uh, Praise Famous Men book to be some of his finest works, um, but he does have a, a grand collection of, of photographs. So um, if you're interested in digging in further to him, I highly recommend it. Um, Evans, um, he didn't get fired. They, they, they say he was dismissed from the FSA. <laughs> in 1937, um, mostly for all the reasons I already described, like he didn't like the rules that Stryker was giving to him. And obviously, if he is, you know, now renowned as a preeminent uh, documentarian of the, the 20th century, he probably didn't need the rules and the regulations that Stryker was, was applying to him. And, you know, he also didn't care much for deadlines. So he never turned anything in on time. And so um, it ended up working out for him, though, because he went on to publish many, many more books of his, his photographs, um, some in combination with others' writings. And then, of course, he um, got a job as a writer and photographer for Fortune magazine. So it kind of worked out in the end. Um, next, we have Dorothea Lang. Um, she was originally a studio photographer. She would do portraits in her studio in San Francisco. And during this time of the Great Depression, she felt a need to take her camera out of the studio and into the streets. And this is her with her large um, format camera there. Her photos of the homeless and unemployed that were standing in the bread lines and labor demonstrations and soup kitchens actually um, led to her job with the FSA. And it's important to acknowledge here that last week I um, mentioned something about Ansel Adams saying that there's more significance in a rock than a line of unemployed. And that's what he was criticizing. He was criticizing these photographs that the FSA photographers were taking. Um, but I think that it's important to know that they were taking these to show everyone the, the reality of what was happening. So from 1935 to 1939, Lang worked with the FSA. Um, she had a, had a sort of leg up on some of the other photographers because she was already, you know, trained as a renowned portrait photographer. So she was able to bring her skill with that into um, making very emotionally um, resounding images um, of, of people. So she, like others, would document the sharecroppers, families who had been displaced from their homes because they couldn't, you know, 
pay their bills and keep their property, migrant workers, and a lot of her images were published and brought this into the, the public eye. This is probably her most famous image. It's Migrant Mother. Um, it is without a doubt the best known documentary photograph of the 20th century and it has become you know iconic of its time but also as representation of you know other hardships over time it's also this symbol of resilience right you've likely seen this before either in a history textbook or um, on television or or in movies you know it's it's again like one of those iconic images of all time the woman in this photograph her name is Florence Owens Thompson you don't often get to know her name and um, in 1960 which is you know 20 years 20 four years after she took this photograph, Dorothy Lang actually like gave a little talk about her experience making this photograph. And I'm going to read to you um, just an excerpt from the talk because I think it's nice to hear what, what she said about the experience. So um, here, here's Dorothy's excerpt. I saw and approached the hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I do remember she asked me no questions. I made five exposures working closer and closer from the same direction. I did not ask her name or her history. She told me her age, that she was 32. She said that they had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that the children killed. She had just sold the tires from her car to buy food. There she sat in that lean-to tent with her children huddled around her and seemed to know that my pictures might help her and so she helped me. There was a sort of a quality about it. Now, um, I think as a lot of artists tend to do, Dorothy Lange's kind of romancing this a little bit and waiting poetic, um, but you know, she sort of saw it as an exchange of like, if you allow me to take your photograph then, you know, something good will come of it. Um, Lang returned home after creating these photographs uh, of, you know, my great mother, Florence Thompson, and she described the conditions of the camp to her editor at the newspaper and gave him two of her photographs to publish. So, of course, the editor goes and informs the federal authorities. He publishes an article that includes the photographs and uh, as a result, the government um, sent, sends food and resources to this camp. And that was, that was the goal of a lot of these photographs being made at this time, was to get help and support to these people who needed it. Now, there's hundreds and thousands of these types of camps, so it's a big job to take on, and not all of them were able to get assistance, but you do what you can. Um, according to Florence Thompson's son, Dorothea Lang got some of the details in her story wrong when she talks about the image, but the impact of this picture was based on the image showing the strength and the need of these migrant workers. Um, the other thing that I like to share is that here are here's the outtakes, the so images that are not as famous as the official migrant mother image, but these are other ones that Dorothy Lang took of Florence and her children. And, you know, you heard in, in the story that she took five images, and that's, you know, that's kind of a lot for this time. If you think about it today, you know, you can rapid fire off 500 shots in 10 minutes. Not that you should or need to, but because we can. And back then, to take five was was a lot, so she was really looking for something very specific emotionally when she was making these images here. Next, I want to talk about Gordon Parks. Um, he was what he was he was working as like a trainee with Roy Stryker, but he created some of his best known photographs. Um, one of his most famous is American Gothic, Washington, D.C. This is the photograph on the right here. 
Um, he named it specifically after the iconic Grant Wood painting, also titled American Gothic, um, which you, it, it, I mean, it's a, a symbol um, that you see everywhere and it's been, you know, used in, in television shows, cartoons, media, ad nauseum to this day, but it really is a legendary painting of this very traditional and stoic white American farm couple. And, you know, Park's image is showing something very different, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a striking but ironic um, comparison between the two. And, um, you know, he's got uh, Ella Watson is her name, the, the woman in the photograph. And she's holding her mop and her broom in front of the American flag. A lot of um, folks will describe this image as haunting, but I don't know that I feel that way about it. Um, you know, it is showing Ella Watson, who worked on the cleaning crew in the FSA building. She's standing, you know, very stiffly, rigidly in front of this American flag hanging on the wall. And, you know, Parks was inspired to create this image because he had been encountering just repeated racist situations in all over the the city right they're in Washington DC so restaurants shops on the streets and during the 1930s um, you know Washington DC was very segregated so he was you know trying to um, create a response to that through this image here um, Parks continues to work with Ella Watson um, and her family, as you can see in this image here. Um, he really wanted to show a series of, of her home life and specifically follow her throughout her day to day. Um, so Stryker did encourage Parks to continue this project of working with Ella Watson, and it did lead to this like great series that, you know, it's um, a non-linear photo series that gives you a glimpse into, you know, her life with her family and, and their home. Um, Parks kind of waxes and wanes about his feelings about the American Gothic Washington, D.C. photograph because sometimes he's like, oh, it was overdone and not subtle, but then, you know, other people really grasp onto that image as an image of, of strength and, you know, um, representing both victim and survivor and you know it's it, it that photo the American Gothic photo has affected a lot more people um, than uh, you know his, his series of, of her and her home there's something very iconic and symbolic about this image that sort of surpasses anything else that he was able to do um, a lot of art historians reflect back on um, Park's work and, you know, when they're studying it, um, he, his work drew much more attention from, you know, people working at the time, people working today, art historians, than any other um, black photographer in federal service during this time. And Today, a lot of historians who are reviewing federally commissioned black photographers of that era, they, they almost exclusively focus on Parks and his um, sort of iconic representations of the times. Um, I have a few more images of his that I like to share so you can kind of get um, a perspective on the breadth of his work. Um, so this one is dinner time at Mr. Hercules Brown's home, Somerville, Maine, 1944. This one is the grease plant worker, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1946. Again, showing laborers as strong and significant. This one is a car loaded with furniture on the highway, 1945. Um, this was a common sight in the Depression and even into the 40s. Um, if you couldn't afford to keep your home, you had to pile on whatever belongings you could afford to keep your car if you were lucky to have one, or if not, then on your back. And then you would go off and seek some sort of encampment um, to sort of live in to survive. 
And then finally, we have this image, which is Ferry Commuters, Staten Island, New York, 1946. And this one, I just love the expressions on everyone's faces. Um, they all look so perturbed to be on this ferry. Um, but also, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, are they reacting this way because he's taking the photograph? Or is this their expression every day? <clears throat> I don't know. But I think even down to, like, as I said earlier, that sort of emotional expression um, that the FSA photographers with their documentary work were able to capture is just so strong and so um, moving in all of their photographs. So um, I know that talking about the depression can be depressing. So we'll flip gears here for a moment and talk about some development in popular science and popular art. So um, first I want to talk about Harold Edgerton. He was a huge player in uh, demonstrating the beauty of scientific photography. Um, a lot of his early work in the 1930s, he made photographs using the strobe lighting system that he had actually helped invent. And that is a super big deal because before this, you know, we the last time we talked about flash was when we were talking about um, Jacob Rees. And it was, you know, in its sort of infancy of development at that point. Um, because we, we, we didn't have electricity, we weren't wired in, um, but as we're moving into the 30s, we now have you know, the, the light bulb and the, the wires to kind of um, really explore what we can do with lighting. And so for those of you who don't know the strobe lighting, you sort of hook it up um, so that it does, at the same time that your shutter closes on your, or opens on your camera, sorry, um, the light flashes. So you can get a very specific amount of light on your subject to either capture um, a very, you know, sp specific way of lighting, but also, um, you know, things that were moving really fast need a, a fast, quick, bright light for you to capture them. And I have some wonderful examples of his images here. One of his most famous is um, the drop of milk splashing into a saucer of milk from 1936. It's a stop action image and without the strobe process you wouldn't have been able to capture this here. And there's just something so striking about these photographs even today. Even though it's easier to make them now, there's something about the first few that are just beautiful. He had worked towards perfecting this strobe lighting throughout the 1930s, and um, he was instrumental in figuring out how to synchronize these intense short bursts of light using engine rotors to kind of facilitate the, the process there. Here we've got a bullet being shot through an apple, which is incredible. Um, in 1939, he started working with the military. Um, they were essentially trying to develop the lighting that would be necessary for doing nighttime aerial photography, which he succeeded with and won a, a Medal of Freedom in 1946 for it. Now, obviously, the, the photograph I'm showing you here is not uh, nighttime aerial photography, but these are some of the other images that he took, used strobe lighting. And some of this one and, and the one that follows here um, really harken back to that work that Moybridge and Murray were doing with their movement studies um, in the past. Um, next we have George Harrell. Um, uh, during the years between World War I and World War II, you have um, this sort of burst in popularity of entertainment magazines. Um, back then they would be called like photo play or modern screen, and um, today it's kind of akin to Us or, or People magazine. And George Harrell, who you see here on the screen with his giant large format camera, because the large format would get you the most detail, uh, he really focused on and emphasized this, um, the, the Hollywood stars and, and their beauty and their sophistication. So he was the chief photographer for MGM Studios. Um, and he would take all of the portraits and then he would go in and edit them all by hand, right? There's no Photoshop, there's no computers, there's no filters, there's none of that during this time. So he would use his retouching pencil to kind of 
um, shape the faces with light and shadow and he would draw in the eyelashes to be you know thicker and sexier and he would create this flawless skin texture and I really like um, what well, I mean I, I like the thought that he was kind of the the human Photoshop of his day but I like that this image here shows you on the left the the original and on the right the retouched photograph because you can really see the difference and it's it's striking. Um, he was also so precise in the way that he did this that you know in his shadow inflections are so nuanced and so numerous that sometimes you think about how much handwork he would put into these photographs it reminds me of pictorialism and you know because it was so important for the pictorialists to have that hand work done in their photographs to show their labor um, but you know this this is different but it's still the handwork on there and so when you look more closely you know pictorialist photographs were famous for the fuzziness right we talked about the fuzzy graph um, this one if you zoom in on it it's sharp perfectly sharp so even though he's going in and doing all this handwork, he is very focused on making sure that it is incredibly precise, sharp, and not fuzzy at all. Now, when World War II erupted, um, Harrell gets drafted to the war, and they don't necessarily do these types of photographs anymore because um, who has the the time or the you know, no one really wanted to put as much effort into retouching them as, as he did. So these types of glamorous images end up getting replaced by more candid photographs. Um, and then, of course, who comes in but the paparazzi, um, who are very aggressive. And they're, they're not called that at this time yet, but later on they end up being called the paparazzi after this um, character in uh, Fellini's 1960 film um, La Dolce Vita. Um, and if you're curious about where that word para paparazzi comes from, um, Fellini, uh, it's, it's derived from an Italian dialect, um, but the word itself reminded him of buzzing mosquitoes, which is kind of what paparazzi are, right? They're annoying and they're in your face and pests and they won't go away until they get their shot. So um, so that's popular science and popular art. I like to break up the depression and World War II with something a little fun there. Now we're going to talk specifically about the role that photography played during World War II and um, this is German photographer Alfred Eisenstadt and he worked for the Associated Press and did a lot of photographs of this man named Joseph Goebbels who if you don't know was the Nazi party's chief propagandist and eventually became the national minister of propaganda in 1933. And it was in that same year that the Nazis made it a requirement that all German photographers would register with the government. So they would know who was supposed to be photographing and who was not. And that's sort of the first step towards um, Goebbels trying to control all of the media, right? The second that you're making your photographers register with you so that they are allowed to photograph that should perk some ears up and some eyes up and be like, hey, hey this is bad. Um, so essentially, if you were registered, you were allowed to photograph and you were supposed to photograph, but if you were not registered, you could be arrested. So um, Goebbels, seen here again, and I hate the way he looks directly into the camera because when I'm looking at this screen and talking to you, he's freaking me out. He's a terrifying man. Um, Goebbels made sure that Hitler's rise to power was documented and revealed to the public through the German illustrated newspaper, which he had major sh um, control over. Um, he was the one who would censor things and build the propaganda and essentially manipulate the media to present Hitler in a very glorious way. So at that time, you would only see images that showed Hitler as heroic. 
and portraits of him that were montaged over pictures of very large and carefully staged political gatherings of the Nazi party. And these images portrayed him as a powerful and popular leader. Hitler's favorite photographer was a man named Heinrich Hoffmann. And Hoffmann um, created two volumes of photographs that showed Hitler not just as a prominent, well-liked political figure, but also as um, a, a kind of every man's man. Like, you know, he's a man of the people. He's reading the newspaper. Oh, he's so normal. Uh, he's he's talking with the farmers and, and shaking their hand. He's, oh, look at him with the with the children. Isn't he such a good guy? And, you know, even him standing out in nature looking at the world. You know, if you don't know what happened in World War II, Hitler was an advocate for ethnic cleansing. And anyone who didn't fit his ideal of the perfect human, he would have arrested and sent to concentration camps where they would be essentially tortured and executed. There were gas rooms where he would send people to be gassed. There would be lines, um, you know, death brigades that would line up all the people and shoot them in the back and dump them in a pit. And I know this is hard to hear, but it was, it was, it's very real. And it's really important because there's a lot of people out there who think that the Holocaust was uh, a conspiracy and that it didn't happen, but it very much did. And, you know, we have Holocaust, a few, very few Holocaust survivors that escaped and, and are still around today to tell the tale. Many of them have since passed if, if they were able to escape at all. But it was a very real thing and a very dangerous thing. And the propaganda that Goebbels was building and around this to sort of deceive the people of Germany and other countries into thinking that he was this glorious God that was come to save them and return Germany to its glory instead of seeing him for what he really was, which is Satan, essentially. Um, anyway, I keep, I'm, I'm going on a, a, a ramble now. Um, anyways, so you can kind of see how photography and the media can build a persona for someone since we all well know that this is not what Hitler was like at all, right? He's not this um, good man of the people. Um, sounds very familiar to a certain president reigning from 2016 to 2020. Um, before we continue, I want to show you a film. Um, it's a, actually an excerpt of the film. Um, because the whole thing is like an hour and 45 minutes, almost two hours long, and I'm not going to make you sit through that. The whole thing will be on the blackboard if you do want to watch it. Uh, it is not required, but it will be there for you if it seems interesting to you. It's called Triumph of the Will, and it's a 1935 German propaganda film that was directed, produced, edited, and co-written by Lenny Reifenstahl. And it essentially chronicles the 1934 Nazi Party Congress that was happening in Nuremberg, and that was attended by over 700,000 Nazi supporters. And so the film itself has excerpts of speeches given by Nazi leaders at the Congress, including Adolf Hitler, um, Rudolf Hess, and Julius Stryker as well. And then there's a footage kind of interspersed of the troops and public reactions. Now, Hitler commissioned this film, and he served as an unofficial executive producer. His name does appear in the opening titles. So if the film is about him, and he's paying for it and producing it, you can imagine that it's going to only be about all the good things about, well, not even the good things, but because there weren't good things about him. He was presenting a false persona to the world and then going and doing evil. But the film's sort of overriding theme is the return of Germany as a great power with Hitler as the leader who's going to bring back glory to the nation. 
So the the film was released in 1935, and it, it was a it's a very prominent example of propaganda in film history. And um, you know, Reifenstahl was using like techniques. Um, film techniques like moving cameras and aerial photography, long focused lenses to create these like really distorted perspectives. And he also was incorporating a lot of music and cinematography. And so um, this kind of earns this film recognition as one of the greatest propaganda films in history. Not that it's a great film. I mean, it's still, you know, propaganda and very problematic and it needs to be, you know, predicated as such. Um, but, you know, Reifenstahl really helped to stage all the scenes. He directed and rehearsed some of them like over 50 times. And he, he won a lot of awards for the film. But and, and it was it was very much popular in the Third Reich. It still influences films and, and documentaries and, and media to, to this day. But it's again, it's, it's problematic, right? In Germany, the film isn't censored, but the courts there do classify it as Nazi propaganda, which requires there to be an educational context whenever it's being um, screened publicly. So I am giving you that educational context here so that you understand that this is not a good thing that happened. And so we're going to watch um, just like the first seven minutes of it. Like I said, it's... Um, and I think that'll be that'll be enough, but it's it's almost two hours. So again, if you want to watch the whole thing on your own, please please do. But keep in mind that like this is not um, me saying that this was an okay thing that happened. This is simply me trying to show you what can happen if you your government allows someone to take over con complete control of your media, which Goebbels was doing, and you know. He was doing it for Hitler, so um, we'll we'll just get it started and then um, take it from there. make sure that you can see the whole thing. All right.
think you get the picture. Um, obviously, it goes on to like um, there's there's speeches and and other things that happen um, in this two hours of, of propaganda that um, they created here. Um, but you know the 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 beginning itself is is enough to make you kind of want to vomit because you're just kind of like okay. They have him being symbolized as a god coming out of the sky and in, in the clouds and an airplane. And then he is being, you know, paraded through the streets and all these people are praising him. And, you know, they're showing him, you know, with the children and their, you know, angelic cherub-like faces. And, they, you know, where I turned it off, there's even a cat, you know, the animal appeal. Um, so... Excuse me. <clears throat> the whole thing is just like it's like that, and it's just made to look, make him look like a savior, and it's just so incredibly bonkers. So, again, if that's interesting to you, the entire thing will be on the blackboard if you would like to watch um, to feel more informed about what was happening around this time. But again, it's not required. So, from 1933 on. As the Nazis were kind of instigating this atmosphere of, of hatred towards the races that um, Hitler was kind of singling out, um, they, you know, most of the time you'll hear them talking about, you know, Jewish folks, um, but there's also folks from a lot of countries surrounding Germany that were being persecuted as well. Um, the Nazis would encourage you to boycott the Jewish shops and they would post signs outside of them like the one that you see um, being held up in this image here that essentially said Jewish business anyone shopping here will be photographed and you didn't want to be photographed because if you were photographed supporting anyone who was on the sort of undesirable list created by Hitler and Goebbels um, you would essentially get arrested and sent to the camps with them so um, there's a, a zero tolerance kind of policy happening with that around that time. Um, so there's other photographers like Roman Vishniak. Um, he would use a lot of hidden cameras um, on his person or elsewhere so that he could make photographs of Eastern European Jewish life. And so he would travel around to Poland and Russia and Hungary and Romania on behalf of um, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, and he would make these photographs that could assist in, you know, money raising efforts to help these Jewish communities that were, you know, essentially thrust into poverty because of the, the Nazis. And by the time that this war was inevitable, Goebbels had decided that there should be no independent media in Germany whatsoever. He wanted to control everything. So, Here's the big list. All journalists, photographers, writers, film and radio producers, publishers, printers, painters, and poets, anyone who was defined, you know, defined their occupation as one of those things, you would be enlisted into the propaganda division of the army. And if you did not enlist, you were either banished or captured and sent to a concentration camp. This is John Hartfeld. He would he was one of the few who was able to really target Goebbels' kind of twisted logic, and he used photo montages to do so. Um, Hartfeld never made his own photographs, but he, you know, like like you did for your uh, photo montages, um, and like we talked about last week, he would select everything from the mass media illustrations, or he would commission. Um, very specific and particular photographs from other photographers. So his um, photo montages did expose the real effects of the Nazi, Nazi social policies on the citizens. And he would almost always publish them in AIZ, which is the Workers Illustrated newspaper. And it was originally a German publication, but Goebbels exiled it. And so at this time, it was being published out of Czechoslovakia and distributed kind of like secretly. So 
Goebbels' effort to kind of bring all media makers into the army under his watch and to work toward his goals essentially exiled many photographers who could see the fresh hell that was about to erupt under the, the influence of, of Goebbels and Hitler. But I think it's really important to understand how um, someone controlling all of the media can really warp society's perspective on what's real and what's not real. And so it, it becomes very dangerous space to be when you're using propaganda. And it really did fuel everyone's perspective on, on Hitler and Goebbels and the Nazis and, you know, a lot of the facets of World War II. So um, essentially that's that. Um, I think that's where I want to leave it off today. Um, I think that going through the depression and a conversation about Nazis is, is plenty. So um, I will end this and see you next time. Thank you.